Remain seated, please. Permanecer sentados, por favor. Like I said in the last video I did, which was all about cultural representation in animation, shows that teach kids about the world are a very valuable thing. Probably the two biggest trailblazers in creating this kind of content for kids on television were Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood in 1968 and Sesame Street in 1969. Fred Rogers cared very deeply about creating a show that treated kids as equals, with real problems, feelings, interests, and relationships. I remember after my dog Mitzi died, my aunt and uncle gave me a toy dog. Like this. Sesame Street's brilliance really comes from the fact that it's wildly entertaining, even for adults. Oh, Rocco doesn't like to play with rocks. Well, why not? He thinks rocks are boring. What? Will you get out of here? I'm Kermit the Frog, and I told you I want my Kermit the Frog t-shirt. Uh, you don't I have to come in here I and try to sell me a nose runner because I do not have a nose. Grover, I'm going to get you from this car. What do you sell? Eight. Eight, like the number eight. Shh. <laughs> Like, like, like the number eight. Right. Oh, that's kind of a weird thing to be selling. This play date is over! Wait, 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 where are you going? Alaska! It's faster if you drive. Go! But is also able to, just like Mr. Rogers, be completely genuine and sincere, and explain difficult topics in terms that young kids can understand. I'm okay calling him on the phone, right? No, son. You, you, you see, uh, when when someone dies, hmm? it, it means they're they're not alive anymore. Their their body has stopped working. They don't eat or uh, or breathe or, or talk on the phone. Sesame Street doesn't just teach kids about letters and numbers. It teaches them about life and things that they'll experience. And both of these shows absolutely still hold up today. And many others have followed in their example. I'm sorry. It's bad news, I'm afraid. The little budgie died. Oh, okay. I used to make it go like this. And then make it pop up again like that. I've got good news. Your bird is okay. Oh, no, no, Mum. You have to pretend it's bad news that the budgie's dead. Oh, are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Okay, um... I have bad news. Oh, did the budgie die? I'm afraid she did. Oh, okay. Well, you get a valuable life lesson. I don't want a valuable life lesson. I just want an ice cream. As for television made for older audiences, if you've ever heard of the term a very special episode in marketing for a TV show, it's pretty much always used to describe an episode that discusses a serious or sensitive topic. This was, of course, Lampooned by Animaniacs. We at the Warner Brothers Studio would like to be included as humanitarian animation nominees, but would never stoop so low as to pander for such a prestigious award. Excuse me, Doc, but I don't believe violence ever solved anything. And to the losers, well, better luck next year. May I borrow this? Certainly. <laughs> These kind of episodes still exist today, although they're generally not promoted as big events anymore. And I think that's a good thing, since it allows them to stand up as their own stories and feel like authentic events in these characters' lives, as opposed to things handed down from the network. And there's one sensitive subject I wanted to talk about, and it's something that's particularly underrepresented in media. And that is periods. I honestly think it's ridiculous that I have to say this, but clearly I do, Florida. Menstruation is a perfectly natural process that happens to a large percentage of the human population. And yet, it can be awkward to talk about. A lot of adults don't even feel comfortable talking about it. I work at the Emporium Magic Kingdom, and we also run the Baby Care Center. If you didn't know, each of the Disney theme parks has a baby care center, complete with baby changing areas, a nursing room, family restroom, and a small pharmacy type store with everything from diapers and formula to medicine and, of course, feminine hygiene products. 
I always feel bad when it's me and some other dude in there and someone comes in to ask about pads and tampons and you can tell that they feel embarrassed about it. But like, why is that? Why is there this stigma about it? And why are some parents deathly afraid to talk to their kids about it? I've never heard anyone walk on eggshells to talk about toilet paper or band-aids. On average, menstruation starts happening at around 13, but it can happen to kids as early as 8. And that's why it's really important that kids know what's going on and what it means and how to deal with it. Because the first time that it happens is usually terrifying for a kid. Even if you do know what's going on. Oh no. Oh no 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 no! And that's why I'm really glad that Disney's really been making an effort to normalize talking about periods in TV shows and movies. In Turning Red, May doesn't actually get her period in the movie. Her mom just thinks that she does. Did the... Did the red peony bloom? No! Maybe? <gasps> but it's too soon. Don't worry, May May. I'll get everything you need. Mommy's here! Jin! Jin! It's happening! Because when you know your daughter's inherited a supernatural ability from her ancestors to turn into a giant red panda, I don't know, I guess maybe your brain goes to the normal thing for a teenage girl at first? But it makes for a pretty funny misunderstanding. And a bunch of parents who apparently don't know how to talk to their children got super upset at Disney and Pixar for daring to even reference the fact that menstrual hygiene products exist in a movie for kids. We watched all the way to the part where the mom brings in ibuprofen and pads. I am absolutely mortified. Luckily, my child was clueless. It's safe to say I've learned my lesson about reading movie reviews before I let my boys watch. Not for children. I'm a young modern parent, I think. However, this film is exactly why I have to approve what my kids watch first. It's extremely unsuitable for children under 13 and should no way be a PG. It highlights sexual feelings, homosexuality, periods, sanitary products, puberty, kissing, gyrating, disobedience, parents are the enemy, words like crap. Oh, and a theme tune called You Want It. It's appealing to children due to the cute fluffy panda as the main artwork, but this is in no way a children's film. As millions keep on stating, Disney, leave our children alone! Never mind the fact that unless you're a kid living in a house where literally nobody has a uterus, chances are you've already seen this stuff and think absolutely nothing of it. I know I didn't give it a second thought as a kid. It was just, oh, that's stuff mom needs. But somehow, this isn't even the stupidest backlash this movie faced. This film takes place less than a year after the September 11th terrorist attacks. I bring this up because it radically altered the culture of the time, in ways that make this movie feel exceptionally ignorant of the time. Even though, literally, the only reason I can comprehend that this movie is set explicitly in 2002 is because the director grew up in that exact year. Turn on the TV, they hit the Pentagon! They hit the f***ing <laughs> Pentagon! The angry parent backlash is honestly extra funny though because it totally seems like something Ming Lee would actually jump on Facebook to complain about if this movie wasn't set in 2002. She's seriously like one of the moms from an r slash insane parent story on Reddit. This happened when I was 17. I worked at a convenience store in Toronto, Canada, just a small shop of your usual convenience store items. It was a typical Thursday night, or so I thought. In storms in Karen, she points her finger Right at my face. What have you done to my daughter? Uh, who? Oh. She had brought her daughter with her, and one of the other kids in the store pointed her out. I had honestly never even seen her before. I should report you to the police! How old are you, Fanny? I'm 17. See? This is what happens when you don't wear sunblock and do drugs all day! She's just a sweet, innocent child! How dare you take advantage of her? It's at this moment that she slams down a couple of torn out sheets of paper with doodles on them her daughter had drawn of me. 
Everyone else in the store, who of course had been staring at the disaster that was unfolding, came over to look, and they all started laughing. I was mortified. I had never even seen this girl in my life. The Daisy Board has lost a loyal customer today! She stormed out. Later that month, the same Karen apparently turned into a freaking kaiju and wrecked the Toronto Sky Dome! Anyways... This movie did a great job of exploring the themes of puberty and generational trauma. I'd argue that Turning Red actually handled the generational trauma stuff better than Encanto did. Later that same year, we got Baymax, a series where Baymax goes around San Francisco and... Dang it, now I'm thinking about all that food at DCA. Anyways, if you haven't seen the Baymax series, it's a really cute series of shorts where Baymax travels around San Francisco and helps people out with their problems of the medical and life variety. In one episode, a 12-year-old middle schooler named Sophia does, in fact, get her first period. Hello, my name is Baymax. I was alerted to the need for medical attention when you said, Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, I'm fine. <laughs> Don't need any, um, robot nurse help. Just a normal kid having a normal bathroom experience. I will scan you now. Wait, what? Scan complete. You have mild seasonal allergies and are currently menstruating. I just got my first period. Correct. Oh, my stomach hurts. Mild abdominal cramping is oh, typical. I can't believe this is happening. This isn't supposed to... I can't... I wasn't prepared for this. Baymax comes equipped with a lot of stuff, but apparently that doesn't include period products. Likely because he was designed by a dude, and making sure that he had that stuff on hand slipped to Dashi's mind. So he heads off to a store to go get some. And he's clueless about what kind to get, so he asks other people in the store for advice. Excuse me, which of these products would you recommend? Oh, um, well, these are the tampons I usually use. Thank you. I prefer pads. They're more comfortable for me. Thank you. I always get the ones with wings. And yes, there's a trans man buying period products in that scene. And unsurprisingly... I've obtained leaked video from Disney's upcoming show, Baymax, which promotes the transgender flag and the idea that men can have periods to children as young as two years old. It's all part of Disney's plan to re-engineer the discourse around kids and sexuality. Thanks to Disney, I now know that bleeding is not my hemorrhoids, a urinary tract infection, or even cancer. I was just having my period. LOLXD. <laughs> <sighs> Anyways, he ends up returning with just way too many different options. And what, did he charge all of this to Aunt Cass's credit card? He finds that Sophia built a toilet paper fort while he was gone, which... Whoever left that much toilet paper in this all-gender restroom in a public middle school, I appreciate that you don't want the place to run out of toilet paper, but you are asking for it to get vandalized. My guts feel like they're tying themselves in knots and my insides are coming out of my outsides and my childhood is over! Oh, that's a lot of information for me to process. I'm sorry, I, congratulations? No, neither of those sound right. Oh hey, it's Remy from Big City Greens. Sophia says that she's upset about getting her period because she thinks it essentially means that her childhood is over. I remember when my cousin Valerie got her period and my tia Mariana wouldn't stop calling her mi mujercita and everyone started treating her differently. I'm not ready for that. I'm not, I'm not done being a kid yet. You are 12 years old. By many cultural standards, you are still a child, a pre-teenager, or tween. But getting your period is supposed to be like this huge deal, and it means I'm different now, right? You are getting older. Your body may change, but you will always be you. And then she and her friend do their ridiculous yo-yo routine for the talent show, and both end up eating it. Yeah, your yo-yo tricks are great, but your gymnastics skills need work. The ghost in Molly McGee is, of course, no stranger to episodes about topics like this. So, when the episode titles for season 2 came out, and one of them was called A Period Piece, I was really looking forward to seeing how they'd handle it. I was also excited to see the episode that it was paired with, which was a theme park episode. Please go watch the Sunnyland video, I worked really hard on it! The episode starts with Molly being stoked for a sleepover while all the other parents are out at a parent-teacher conference night. Libby is a little nervous about Andrea coming over, which is understandable considering a traumatic experience that she had in third grade. Whenever I think about being at a sleepover with Andrea, it reminds me of the third grade sleepover and the incident. Oh, the incident. 
could also be nerves about the crushing pressure to be vulnerable with a new friend at sleepover level. And when Andrea arrives, Libby suddenly experiences cramps and runs to the bathroom, where sure enough, she finds out that she's gotten her first period. I don't think I know your Aunt Flo. Was she at your bat mitzvah? <laughs> Molly! How adorably naive you are. She means she got her first period. <gasps> well, but th this wasn't on the fun agenda. We're scheduled to build a pillow fort. Thankfully for Libby, Andrea is really chill about it and even has a spare set of pajamas for her. Molly goes to her dad for help with getting period supplies, and of course, he thinks that she's gotten her period at first. Um, I actually need period supplies for, uh... <gasps> Molly, I'm so proud of the adult you've blossomed into. <laughs> Now, what's important to know is that menstruation is a normal, natural process, wherein your body... Stop! No! Stop! Stop! I didn't get my period! Libby did! Oh, well, know that when your moment comes, I have a very moving speech planned. Now let me get those supplies. Pete is such a great dad. Good news! I've reorganized the linen closet. Bad news! Your mom's fresh out of period products. But never fear, I'll just run to the store and pick some up. Scratch being Scratch decides to tag along to the store so that he can manipulate Pete into buying an absurd amount of snacks that they don't need. And, much like in Baymax, Pete buys way more than they actually need because he wants to make sure that Libby has options. Meanwhile, back at the house, Libby and Andrea bond over interests fueled by tween hormones. Ew. We are now united by a period pact. <laughs> An unbreakable bond of sisterhood that will last forever. And Molly feels like her friends are growing up without her and leaving her behind. After mishearing one of Daryl's cheese wheelings and trampoline dealings as advice... Look, you don't want to get cut out of this deal. This could be a three-way pact. <gasps> You're right. If I uh, want to... Ooh, ooh, ha, hang with the big kids, I gotta act like an owl. Like a big kid. I, I mean a grown-up. Thanks for the advice, Daryl. Ow. You can only pay me in pogo sticks. I can make that work. She decides to completely overcompensate and act as adult as possible. This goes about how you'd expect. <gasps> Molly, you look grown up, sophisticated. Thank you for noticing. <laughs> oh, I can't pretend anymore. I'm not a grown up like the two of you. I understand if you want to go home, drink coffee, and do taxes. You don't have to hang out with a little kid like me anymore. Molly, uh, what are you talking about? Well, you two have your whole period packed thing, and you've outgrown me. I get it. What? We could never outgrow you. You're my best friend. Our best friend. And like, it's no big if you don't have your period yet. Everyone's body is on their own timeline. We all grow at our own pace in our own special ways. And we'll be right here when you have your big moment too. Camembert? Classy choice. Yeah, Daryl had a whole bunch of cheese for some reason. Now, this last show I want to talk about is actually the oldest of the four, but I wanted to talk about it last because it sort of gives you an idea of what can happen if your kid doesn't know about this. And that show is Camp Camp. In case you're unfamiliar, Camp Camp is a Rooster Teeth adult animated comedy about a dysfunctional summer camp that advertises itself as a whole bunch of different camps to trick people into sending their kids there. There's Extreme Sports Camp. <laughs> Magic camp. <laughs> Space camp. Theater camp. <laughs> Art camp. It's a dog. Other magic camp. Lightning bolt! And lots more. Lots of stuff. The two camp counselors, David. And you believe it, Max? We're getting not one, not three, but two new campers today. And Gwen. Oh, God, it's coming back. The crippling anxiety and regret. Uh, Gwen? have to hold everything together. The main trio of kids that lead the show is Max, a pessimistic and jaded 10-year-old. I'm not here to make friends, David. I'm here because camp is where kids are sent when their parents don't want to deal with them. Why do you think we return the favor when they hit 70? Nikki, the rambunctious and chaotic nature-loving adventure camp girl. I'm an agent of chaos. I want a Viking's funeral. Light me up! And Neil, the nerdy, awkward science camp kid. This isn't what I signed up for. I just wanted science camp. Not science camping more! I don't want more! The episode Nikki's Last Day on Earth starts with Neil testing out a tonic to make his voice deeper. Because that's never had any negative effects in a cartoon. So what did you do with the rest of that potion? I dumped it in Stan's coffee. Any of you kids seen my girdle? Where my girdle at? <laughs> <laughs> what? What's so funny? I'm Grunkle Stan! Kids laughing. Laughing at they grunkle. 
Nikki drinks it, thinking it's a soda, and starts complaining about the worst stomach ache she's ever felt. Nikki drank my untested tonic and now her stomach is exploding! Relax, Neil. She probably just needs to fart or something. No, this isn't like a poop pain. This is like alien pain. But with Neil not wanting to let David and Gwen know that he potentially made Nikki sick, they go to see Dolph instead. Dolph is a little German kid in art camp. And yes, the whole joke is that he looks like Hitler, but he's actually like the sweetest kid at this camp. And upon describing her symptoms... My insides feel all twisted, like Twizzlers, but horrible, like Red Vines. Dolph informs her that she's dying. I'm afraid it is a case of death. <gasps> what? But of course, we all know what's actually happening here. They have Space Kid go stall David and Gwen while the rest of the campers try to give Nikki a memorable last day on Earth. But they all end up spending the day doing things they don't want to do. And Nikki, of course, continues to experience weird food cravings. Whoa, I would not think of dunking corn dogs in an ice cream burrito. Interesting choices, madam. Cramps. Aw, you guys, that's really... Oh, sweet. And mood swings. I am dying, Max! You just don't care because you're selfish and you only ever care about yourself! That's what selfish means! Whoa. Wow. Sorry. And then, after Space Kid casually mentions that Nikki's dying... Oh, great! I'm gonna go tell Nikki she can die in peace now. Okay. okay. Wait, what? David and Gwen finally show up and stop them from setting her on fire. Kids! I'm concerned about the amount of times I've had to ask this, but why are you trying to set Nikki on fire? Once she explains what's going on, Gwen immediately understands. Odd food cravings? Yes! Oh, gay! Mood swings? What? No! Shut up! <laughs> oh, Nikki. <laughs> Come with me. So, Nikki's not dying? Nope. She's just growing up. What? No, that's even worse! I think this episode does the best job of showing just how much periods can absolutely suck. And it's worth noting, Nikki's probably around 10 years old, so she's on the young side to be getting her period. Her mom's obviously had at least one brief conversation with her about this. Also, Gwen is feeling under the weather, and this is one of the few activities that I can do without her. Uh, space Kid, don't eat that. It's not space food. Under the weather? Those are just rocks. Lady sickness. My mom used to get that all the time. How do you cure it? Edge closer to death. But there wasn't enough detail for her to realize that that was what this was. Which brings me back to the state of Florida's ridiculous law saying that schools can't give any sex ed before 6th grade. Now, imagine if Nikki was at school when this had happened, with no adult there that was able to have any kind of discussion with her about it. How frustrating and even terrifying that would be. Especially since we know her mom is, uh... Not the most attentive mom in the world. Nicolette, I thought we signed you up for those flower girls or something. No, mom, that was last year, remember? I got run out by all those mean girls. It was kind of traumatic for me. Oh, sweetheart, you know I can't keep up with all your silly little adventures. USA Today did a really good article about the controversy surrounding Turning Red back when that came out. They interviewed Dr. Robin R. Miller, who's an interim chief of adolescent medicine and pediatric and adolescent gynecology at Nemours Children's Hospital. I don't think that periods are talked about on a consistent basis in households, and I think that oftentimes people just aren't aware. It's nice to give them the tools they need to really deal with things. I know some girls who thought that they were going to die. They didn't want to scare their family, so they laid down that night with the arms across their chest, ready to die, and when they woke up the next morning with their bed soaked in blood, they were shocked they were still alive. And the reality is that not all parents are created equal. Not all parents are as good as Pete with the pamphlets on menstruation at the ready. The idea that this kind of education needs to be left strictly up to the parents is not a good one, because it leaves kids completely at the whims of their parents and at risk of being unprepared. Yes, cisgender boys need to know about this too. I'm not saying you need to sit every 8-year-old down and give them a high school's level sex ed lesson, but for crying out loud, they should have a basic level of understanding of their own bodies. Leave our children alone. Are we sure Maddie B here isn't actually Carrie White's mom? There's a lot of things kids have to deal with as they're growing up, and they need all the support that they can get. Parents should have these kinds of conversations with kids, but schools really need to be able to offer that kind of support as well. And normalizing talking about periods in media is important. Normalizing it allows adolescents who are going through puberty and dealing with those changes to feel so much more confident and accepted. Just like with the cultural representation, seeing life reflected in media is good for self-esteem and mental health. And again, it can even be an educational tool. 
And if states are going to tell schools that they can't do anything, somebody's got to pick up the slack here. Hey, David. When will I get my period? <sighs> I can't even bring up Texas Chainsaw that would make them die. I think if they saw... Oh, what's a spooky cartoon? That's not really... They saw Nightmare Before Christmas. They would have a heart attack. Fatal. And just die on the spot. I... How do I explain to my children that skeletons are inside of people? <laughs>